Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 13010. This is Evidence and Proof, Week 2 of 2018. Term number one, thank you very much for joining us. We have a few people online. For those that are watching the recorded session, please consider joining us live. I think it's much better to have an interactive class and we have quite a few people in the class, so um, I would expect that our numbers will increase as we progress. I should indicate that uh, if you're watching this recording and you think, well, I tried a link and it didn't work, I did er very early on change the um, link number for Zoom, but those that have joined us tonight tell me that they simply followed the link which is currently on the front page of Moodle, so you should have no excuse or difficulty in finding us. All right, so tonight we're dealing with issues to do with relevance and admissibility. We're dealing with some of the topics that are dealt with in chapter one of the text, and chapter one of the text has a slightly longer title. Uh, when I'm talking about the text, I'm talking about Queensland Evidence Law. This is the fourth edition. That is, in fact, the prescribed text for the unit. Uh, if you're working off unit uh, of the third edition, which is quite recent, that'll be fine as well. And indeed, the notes still refer to the third edition but uh, you should be able, to be able to find your way around the third or the fourth quite comfortably. So the first chapter of the text deals with nature, sources and function of the law of evidence um, and a big part of that is relevance and admissibility. So last week we talked about some of the things that you need to consider in evidence law and it is, if you like, a subset of the old IRAC principle. We're really dealing with the application phase and we're dealing with this in the context of court proceedings. I should make this comment so that it's fairly clear hopefully at the start and that is that the evidence law that we take or teach in this unit is primarily evidence law that relates to evidence in say a criminal or civil trial in the civil um, in, in the main courts, the higher courts, so the district court, the Supreme Court, um, the Court of Appeal, and in the federal jurisdiction, so the federal court. But you'll be acutely aware that some of the rules of evidence that are that we teach in this unit are not strictly applied in other jurisdictions. I think I mentioned this last week, such as the um, Administrative Appeals Tribunal, the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal. Uh, family law proceedings involving children, etc. So everything that we say in terms of evidence and admissibility must be made subject to the overall rider that you must consider and check the way in which evidence or um, can be introduced, or better still, how an arbiter of fact in certain jurisdictions are able to inform themselves. In other words, um, it may be that they can inform themselves in whatever way they see fit to do so. Okay, so keep that in mind. But generally speaking, we're talking about the higher courts, mostly in the state jurisdiction, but also the federal jurisdiction. In order for something to be considered by a jury or a judge, if the judge or the magistrate is determining questions of fact, in a final hearing is whether the evidence is relevant and admissible. Now, we've only got a small class, so again, I won't select people to answer questions, but I will generally invite you to unmute your microphone and provide a response or ask a question or use the chat facility to do so. So if we had a large class, I'd be saying, all right, who wants to tell me what is what we mean by relevance and what we mean by admissibility? Why aren't the two the same? So you're welcome to answer if you like. Anyone want to have a crack? All right, so relevant material is material that is placed before a court and it may rationally affect, either directly or indirectly, an assessment of the probability of the evidence of a fact in issue in the proceedings. All right, so let's break that down a bit. The first is that in order to be relevant, it needs to be evidence which, if it's accepted, could affect the overall decision or at least 
an assessment of the probability of an existence of a fact in issue, if you like, a material fact. Now, there is no definition at common law and there's no definition in the Queensland Evidence Act. However, you may have noticed that in the Commonwealth Act, which is the Evidence Act 1995, also known as the Uniform Laws of Evidence, Section 55 does provide us with a definition of what is relevant. Now, that's a great start, starting point. So um, if you want to see what is relevant, at least in the Commonwealth jurisdiction, um, then you look at Section 55 of the Evidence Act. So it says that evidence is relevant in the proceedings if, is, if it was accepted, could rationally affect it directly or indirectly, the assessment of the probability of the existence of the fact in issue in the proceedings. And it goes on to say that evidence is not taken to be irrelevant only because it relates to credibility of a witness or admissibility of other evidence or failure to adduce evidence. Okay, so that's relevance. So the first thing is it has to be relevant. Second thing is it has to be admissible. So what that indicates to me is that it's quite possible to have relevant material, which is based on fact, which is not admissible. Okay, let's see if we can work through an example to give some idea as to why we would have a system, why on earth, you might say, we would have a system where relevant material is not presented to a jury. You might say, well, surely if it's relevant, it should be given to the jury for consideration. Why would you not admit some relevant evidence? Any thoughts? Yes, Amelia? Uh, is it because some of the evidence can be unreliable? Um, some of it can be misleading? Um, and then... Um, is there a third one? Samantha's ready on the buzzer. Uh, yeah, go, Samantha. <laughs> That's a good, good start. Very good, Amelia. Samantha? Uh, I just had, um, it could be illegally obtained or could be hearsay or an opinion. Yes, yes. Or it might be against public policy, for example, for that relevant evidence to be produced. So thank you, Amelia. Thank you, uh, Sam. Uh, is it Sam or Samantha? Oh, Either. 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 Okay. And I could see that Vivian was working very hard there as well. So thank you very much for that contribution. Okay. So something might be relevant and yet it's not admissible. So we've identified in a quick fire session some of the reasons for that. Vivian, did you want to add something? Um, if, okay, so evidence could be re relevant, but it, it can be inadmissible because the witness has um, a claim to privilege. Ah, yes, maybe so. Yes, so that if, might there, be if there is, yeah, if there is a claim to privilege, then the, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not admissible. Yeah. So the broad, I guess, the broad answer is, without putting any flesh on the bones just yet, we could say, yeah, there's a lot of things that are relevant that may have a bearing on your decision about something, but only some of it is admissible. The court will only allow some of it through. I mean, and you could almost say this entire unit relates to that distinction. But let's firstly, while we're on the topic, let's firstly talk about admissibility, sorry, at relevance. So we know that the starting point is you won't find it in the common law, you won't find it in the Queensland legislation, but you could look at section 55 of the uniform law um, to get some idea of what we're looking for. Let's take this example. Okay, so, and I'm making this up as we go, so this is dangerous. Um, someone is before the court charged with burglary. The suggestion is that they broke into a warehouse at night and stole some items. Okay. Uh, or, or a house, for example, um, if it's a burglary, uh, broke into a house at night, stole some items. And the Crown wished to lead evidence of a neighbour who says that the driver of the car 
um, sorry, the person who drove the car to the scene was driving a red car. Now, it may be that the Crown then produces evidence of a witness who says that a certain person has a red car. And you might think, well, that's relevant because the driver of the car was driving a red car. So now we're talking about somebody else's evidence. And they might say, well, they saw this driver driving a red car at a supermarket three days earlier. Now it starts to get a bit more remote, doesn't it? Now we're not talking about someone seeing something that occurred on the night. We're seeing somebody saying something about this red car three days earlier at a shopping centre. And then, you know, like if we had a free-for-all situation, the defence might call a witness to say, yes, but that was Mrs Bloggs who saw this red car and she doesn't have very good hearing. Um, and we know that because we've called Mrs. Blogg's neighbour, who says that um, Mrs. You know that, that Mrs. Bloggs has to shout all the time, and she and her husband they're shouting all the time because they're hard of hearing. You know, so if you do that, and that's a very poor example, but you can see what I'm getting at in that something that might be barely relevant, we bring that into evidence, and it snowballs, and then suddenly, um, you know, prosecution, if it was a free for all would come in and say, well, that person who's challenging the evidence of Mrs. Bloggs because she uh, says she doesn't hear very well, well, that person's a known liar because we've got evidence that 13 years ago, she was telling lies to an authority and they bring in the authority to give evidence that this witness who was talking about Mrs. Bloggs, who was talking about a car seen three days before the event at a different location was lying. And then... You know, so it just goes on and on until the point where if it was a free-for-all, you'd be arguing about these facts and having to remind yourself as to why is this important? I don't, why are we talking about something uh, of some allegation of fraud involving someone who's not at all associated with this case 13 years ago? Do you, do you, know, do you know what I mean? So it has to really relate to something which is a material fact in the proceedings. So it has to be relevant in a substantive sense, not just bare relevance. We're not interested in bare relevance. Okay, so if it's relevant, it might be admissible. It might be admissible because it has a bearing on the case and it's not otherwise excluded. So those things that Amelia, you were talking about, Samantha, you were talking about, and Vivian, you were talking about as well, in some ways relate to the next point. And that is, okay, if it's relevant, and it's relevant in that it might have an effect on an assessment of probability of something that actually matters, it may not still get in because it may be excluded. And it may be excluded because our law says it should be excluded. In some ways, it's, it's pretty comforting because you don't have to worry so much about the why, but just the fact that it is. So in Queensland, it would be nice in an assessment piece if you could say a defendant's criminal history is excluded as inadmissible evidence because of this reason, but we all know it is. So you can just say that's what it is and just accept that that's the case. If you can go further and say why, that's really good. Um, so lots of relevant information evidence is not admissible either because it's only barely relevant or it's excluded. So a large part of what we talk about is what's excluded. So all those things that you talked about are really excluded relevant material because our law says it should be excluded. Okay. So if, however, something is relevant and it's not excluded, that's not the end of the matter. Mm. Now, who was it that mentioned issues to do with reliability? Is that you, Amelia? Yeah. Okay. Reliability is a funny one because, if you like, there are four steps here. The first is it's got to be relevant. Second is it's got to be admissible. Third is it's got to be reliable. And fourth, it's got to have some probative value. Okay. Reliability is funny because it kind of straddles two and four. 
and it almost sits independently uh, in a, uh, on there because if something is unreliable and it's found to be unreliable, then either it will be not presented as admissible, admissible, admissible evidence. So reliability then is caught by the admissibility rules and it's excluded because it's not, because it's so unreliable that it would be unfair for it to be presented as evidence. But if it's presented as evidence, if the court says, no, I'm going to let it in, even though you're arguing it's unreliable, you then treat it as part of the probative value. Particularly when I say you, I mean really essentially defence counsel, says, okay, I couldn't exclude this evidence on the basis that it was so unreliable as not to be of any quality to put to a jury. It's in there, but I will now argue to the jury, okay, it's there, but you give it very little probative weight. So can you see that reliability, as it were, has a foot in both the admissibility argument and the argument about probative value, depending on whether it's included or excluded from the material that is presented to a jury? Oh, that's a lot of words for a simple concept, but I hope you get it. Vivian, is that all good? Yes. Fine with that? Okay. Amelia, you happy with that answer? Yes, very much. Great. Okay, so and the reason I'm repeating myself is it's important that we ingrain these concepts, ingrain these, these, this methodology of thinking. So it might be relevant, but it may not be admitted. It might be unreliable, and if it's unreliable, it might be admitted or it might be excluded. But all of that we consider at the end of the day whether it has any probative value. Now let's talk about some of the issues that relate to the admissibility of relevant information. So we know that evidence can be relevant and yet not admitted. So what are some of the tests that we apply in determining whether this information, this evidence, should be admitted or not? Now there's no one right answer for this. There's a whole lot of examples that we might use. And what I'm going to suggest is this. As you work your way through the unit, create for, your list, uh, for yourself a statement or a list of material that might be relevant, but is excluded, and then sp say why it's excluded. And you've already made a great start. You've already raised about five or six points. There might be a few more, but then under each of those subheadings, just add a bit more meat to the bones. So it ends up looking like a kind of a flow chart slash checklist, if that makes sense. All right, so we're going to talk about one of them now. Smith against the Queen, 2001-206 CLR 650. Always a good idea to write the citation down. Probably a good idea to have a look at the case. But when you read a case, you don't need to read every word. You can get a, a, a feel for the case either through some commentaries or maybe the head note, and then you speed read through the case. I perhaps shouldn't say that. Maybe I should be saying you should read every word of every case, but it'll just be too much work for you to do that. Okay, so Smith against the Queen, 2001, 206, CLR 650. Does anyone know the case? Okay, I was just giving you a chance to really show off there. Uh, there was no expectation that you would. Smith, the defendant, was convicted of a bank robbery. What happened is that police officers were given the chance to testify that they had had some previous dealings with Smith. And they could say from their previous dealings with Smith that he was, in fact, the person who was seen in a photograph taken at the scene. Now, that's curious evidence. It might be relevant that the police had previous dealings with Smith and it might be relevant that the police could identify him, that is the person in the photograph, the robber, as Smith. But what's the problem with that evidence? Even though it's relevant evidence, why is it that the court rejected the evidence of the police officers? 
They did so for two reasons. Yes, Amelia? Um, is it because the, the, the police don't necessarily know the person, so they could be identifying someone similar um, or that looks similar to the photo provided? That's an excellent response, and that's what I've earmarked as the second reason why that material, that evidence was, albeit relevant, why it was excluded. So a really good point. Thank you. What was the first issue? And the words that I stress were, the police had previous dealings. The court didn't like that. Any idea why? Because they were assuming that he was a previously, like a bad person previously, so that the jury would give that then weight that yep. if he's done it once, he's probably going to do it again type thing. Perfect. Very good. Because <laughs> when I said to you that the police officers got into the witness box and said to the jury, oh, we've had previous dealings with Smith, what, what do you think? You think, oh, he's a crimp. If they know him very well, he's a regular. Um, that's prejudicial, isn't it? Yeah, prejudicial. Under our law, mm -hmm. something might be relevant. It might prove something, but the prejudice of that information might be so great as to outweigh its probative value. Mm -hmm. So that's a nice little phrase for you to remember, that the prejudice outweighs the probative value. I'd write that down and use that. Think about it. Lawyers use it a lot. Objection, Your Honour, prejudice outweighs the probative value. Okay. So in Smith against the Queen, the High Court said, no, that evidence of the police officers should not have been given to the jury. Number one, the fact that they say they had previous dealings with Smith was prejudicial. Its probative value, uh, sorry, its prejudice outweighs its probative value. And number two, by looking at the photo and saying that Smith, all they were really doing in the context of identifying is providing their opinion that the man in the photograph was Smith. They weren't actually, it wasn't a fact, it was an opinion. So we're going to exclude your opinion evidence. Now, it's a it's, this is a really fine line here. And I want you to think about it in this context as well. That when you're arguing a certain case, you have an option, depending on whether you're prosecution or defence, to argue things in separate ways. So a prosecutor might say, we have an eyewitness who positively identified this person as being the perpetrator of the crime. Defence stand up and say, that wasn't a positive identification, that's just an opinion and it's inadmissible. So just start to think in terms of a mindset that there may be a correct answer here, but we're not so much interested in the correct answer as we're interested in the respective arguments that might be presented so that it's up to the judge and the jury to think about what's the right answer. Our job, without misleading and acting ethically, is to present the argument and the counter-argument. So I'm talking here as prosecution and defence lawyer primarily. So you might find that comforting. I mean, when it finally tweaked to me that that's our role as lawyers, I actually found it comforting because I thought, okay, I'm relieved here. I don't necessarily have to find the right answer. What I have to do is mount a good argument. Depending on the circumstances, and I do so ethically, but my job is to mount the argument. And when you're mounting an argument, it's always a good idea to try and mount the counter argument as well. So it gives you a better chance to anticipate what your opponent might say and deal with it accordingly. Have I explained that concept well enough that you feel comfortable about mounting the argument as opposed to necessarily finding the answer? Yes, Amelia? Yes, yeah, very much so. Good, good. Okay, which leads me then to the next case. West Australia against Billos, B-I-L-O-S. It's um, bill loss number two. Um, it's 2009-193-A CRIM-R, Australian Criminal Law Reports, 165. 
West Australia against Belos, number two, 2009, 193 ACRIM R165. Court came to a different conclusion. In that case, bank robbery, 10 years before the trial, ex-wife gets in the witness box, identifies Belos. That's him. She met him three months after the offence. She was in a better position to identify him closer to the date of the robbery than the members of the trial jury 10 years down the track. I mean, if they're trying to identify someone from what that person looks like now, compared with what they were like back then, it's a potentially difficult task. But his ex-wife, well, she knew him, well, not at the time of the incident, but three months after the incident, and she knew him on the day of the trial. So she was able to say, yeah, that's him. I know that photograph is 10 years old, but that's him. I can identify him. And the court allowed that identification evidence in on the basis that it is relevant and it's admissible because the jury can't really make that assessment now. That was a big part of it. Now, you might say, well, oh, my goodness, I'm confused. Because in 2001, the High Court said the police officers are giving evidence about what happened um, previously, and they gave, it was their opinion that it was him. And here we have the ex-wife who looks at a photograph and she's allowed to say, yeah, that was him and that was admissible. So don't stress over it too much. Just keep these cases in mind so you can gently argue one in favour of the other, depending on which way you're going to go. Does that make sense? Right, let's look at a third case along the same lines. It's R against Breeze, B-R-E-A-S-E, -E, 2013 QCA, which is the Queensland Court of Appeal, 249. So that's B-R-E-A-S-E. -E. The Court of Appeal upheld a trial jury's decision to admit evidence from two witnesses. They knew the accused. They recognised him on security footage. This was three years after the event. So the court said, there are certain things that the witnesses can identify from this CCTV footage that members of the jury would not necessarily be able to identify. It wouldn't be obvious to them in trying to make an assessment as to identification um, because these witnesses could give evidence about his height, his posture, his gait, the manner in which he walked and, uh, and hairline those things wouldn't necessarily be obvious to a, a jury three years down the track. I mean, defence counsel, we, w this is what we do. Um, if someone is on CCTV footage and there's clear evidence of tattoos on an arm, um, def the defendant will wear long sleeves, won't they? To make it not as easy for a jury to identify him or her in those circumstances. In that Isn't circumstance, it? can you um, ask the witness or the defendant to like roll up sleeve, his sleeves? No. Um, oh. So that would be, if you like, a demonstration or uh, real evidence and um, there's no obligation on the defence to proffer or participate in that type of situation. So no. Okay. All right. So... Well, we've, uh, we've looked at one example. It's just one sort of series of examples to do with identification um, in the context of evidence that may or may not be admissible, even though it's relevant. Okay, but you get the idea. What we're going to do is we're going to have like a huge, this would be a great thing. If you had a huge whiteboard, like a huge whiteboard on your wall, and you could put relevant, and then you could have all these things saying, Yes, but it's got to be admissible and all these things as to why it wouldn't be admissible. Exclusion, that'd be really good. You could study that. Okay. Apart from the strict rules that apply throughout this course, there's another concept that I want you to bear in mind. It's very important. And that is that courts have a discretionary power. So if as defence counsel you're just not getting there, you're not mounting an argument that appears to be working, you can always say, and Your Honour, the court does have a general discretion to exclude evidence. And this 
in a way comes back to that issue of prejudice versus probative value. Have a look at section 130, sorry, 135 of the Commonwealth Evidence Act, which says that there's a general discretion to exclude evidence. I mean, this is based on common law principles. So have a look at the, you know, the Christie discretion, for example. But section 135 says, the court may refuse to admit evidence if its probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger that the evidence might be unfairly prejudicial to a party or be misleading or confusing or cause or result in undue waste of time. Prosecution want to lead evidence of somebody who saw something 13 years ago that is barely relevant to the case. Your Honour, objection, your court has a general discretion to exclude evidence. It's a waste, undue waste of court's time to go down this avenue. Or prosecution might want to raise evidence of criminal history, objection, that it, the evidence is prejudicial to the point where it um, its probative value is substantially outweighed by that prejudice to the party. Do you see what I mean? So even though there's nothing in the Queensland Act and there's nothing in the common law as such, have a look at section 135 in the Commonwealth jurisdiction, the Evidence Act, and you can use that type of argument more generally. Another word of warning, if, for example, and I think assessment two is along these lines. If you're um, asked to make comment about the admissibility of evidence in a particular jurisdiction, don't quote information or legislation that is for a different jurisdiction. Okay, so if you're asked to consider the um, evidentiary value of material in a Queensland Supreme Court murder trial, then you don't quote section 135 of the Commonwealth Act as giving the court a general discretion to exclude the evidence. I mean, you can use the principle, but you don't actually quote the section. You'll have to quote either the Queensland Evidence Act or common law um, authorities for the argument that you wish to make, even though you may have thought of it as a result of reading the Commonwealth legislation. If you want maybe just an extra little bit of zing to your paper, you can maybe put in a footnote reference to say, this principle applies at common law. It's been dealt with in this case, open brackets, and it's also reflected, by the way, it's also reflected in the Commonwealth jurisdiction, section 135. But don't, you know, don't quote it as the authority for your proposition. Okay, now I think there's a question in the chat facility. Has there ever been a case where the criminal history has been allowed? Um, yes, if you look at the word case in a more broad sense, happens all the time, um, every day of every week. If you consider a case as being a sentence hearing. So when we're talking about the admissibility of matters, I, I should say that I'm really looking at it from a trial perspective rather than say a sentence hearing. So, if it's in sentencing, a criminal, a defendant, then criminal histories go in all the time. There's no problem with that. Um, but if it's a trial before a jury or even a magistrate who's trying to determine guilt or innocence, then in Queensland law, no, the criminal history doesn't go in. Um, not always. There are exceptions. We'll talk later about similar fact evidence and um, issues where previous criminal convictions are admissible in very limited circumstances. Now, of course, that's in Queensland. The law applies differently elsewhere. Um, and the law, the parliament in Queensland has said, has said, we're not going to allow criminal histories in Queensland, but that may change in the future. There may be a, some, at some stage in the future, that may change. So good question. Thank you, Samantha. All right, so um, let's look, we've talked about the general discretion if you like, and um, we've looked at section 135 of the Act. Sometimes, uh, and I mentioned before that um, sometimes the reason the evidence is excluded is that it talks not so much about primary issues, but it talks about secondary issues, or it might even talk about collateral issues. You know, I was talking about 
you know, this person who saw a red car three days ago somewhere entirely differently, is that really going to be important? Is it really part of the primary issues? Is it, is, is it even a secondary issue or is it a collateral issue? Let's have a look at a case. It's called Goldsmith against Sandilocks, 2002, 190 ALR at 370. In that case, the um, issue was to do with identification, um, but in a special way. Goldilocks, sorry, Goldilocks, Goldsmith. I was, I did, I'd say that. It's my way of remembering Goldsmith, not Goldilocks, Goldsmith. Goldsmith against Sandilands. So Goldsmith and Sandilands were police officers. They conducted a, a chase, a high-speed chase. Now, Goldsmith claimed an injury because of the way Sanderlands was driving. It's really nasty. It's sort of like, you know, one police officer saying, you drove badly, you've caused me injury, I want compensation. Anyway, Sanderlands argued that Goldsmith injured his back playing indoor cricket several days earlier. So this is getting interesting, isn't it? One, cop, one copper saying, you caused my back injury because of the way you drive. It wasn't my driving. You did it three days earlier playing indoor cricket. Now, Sanderlands identified an incorrect cricket venue. He said it was you playing indoor cricket three days earlier and it was down at the Albion Indoor Cricket Centre. The High Court held that the name and description of the street in which this indoor cricket centre was conducted was collateral. It wasn't really that important, even if it was incorrect. Even if it wasn't the Albion Cricket Centre, it was the Eagle Farm Cricket Centre, the courts, and you know, and it wasn't on Smith Street, it was on Jones Street. The court said, we don't care. It's really a collateral fact. It's not even a secondary issue. Um, and it really didn't bear on the on Sanderland's credit because, you know, defence counsel would get up there and say, he has blatantly lied to, it might say, he's blatantly lied to the court. He said it was at the Albion Cricket Centre and the evidence established is, is it was at the Eagle Farm Cricket Centre. And he even got the name of the street wrong, you know. Um, so it goes to his credit. The court said, look, it's, it's evidence um, that is relevant. He got it wrong, but it's collateral. So essentially don't worry about it. And that's good law because it means we're not going to spend hour after hour, day after day, talking about these collateral arguments. It's really got to be evidence that goes to a material fact uh, to be admissible and be given weight. Does that make sense? Okay. So there are three basic ways in which relevant material might be excluded. Three basic ways. Number one, Amelia got this right before, it might be excluded because it's unreliable. And it might be called unreliable because it's hearsay or it's opinion, evidence. Or if it is included, it might be said, look, it's, it's unreliable. It's, it's included. It's unreliable because the person didn't have very good eyesight. That goes to how much weight you can put on that value, on that evidence. But... Number one, it's excluded because it's unreliable. Number two, it's excluded on the basis that it may have a tendency to mislead. And what we'd normally say is that the, the um, probative, the prejudicial effect outweighs the probative value. It's misleading evidence to say this is the person's criminal history because it just has too much weight attached to it. Its prejudice is just so high that it blinds the jury to everything else. So we're going to exclude that evidence because it has a tendency to mislead the jury. And the third is the evidence might be excluded on grounds of public policy. Why exclude that evidence on public policy? Well, it may have been ob obtained illegally or unfairly. So they're the three basic rules. 
Now, there's a lot of overlap here because you might say, well, if it's obtained illegally, wouldn't that be unreliable? If it's obtained illegally, wouldn't that have a tendency to mislead? We tend to put it in the third category of saying it's public policy, but there is some overlap. So don't think necessarily of these things as being pigeonholed in the one category, as we talked about in terms of um, issues to do with reliability earlier, maybe being in one of two camps. Look, I'm going to show you something, oh, it's in the notes actually, um, the flowchart, which is contained in the Evidence Act 1995. Um, I have got it. I'm just going to share the screen for a moment. I know I'm moving slowly through this material, but I hope that it's helping uh, you. Let's have a look at this. If I've got the right material, I'll share the screen. And can you see some notes about the Evidence Act, Commonwealth? Chapter 3. Is that what it says? Yes. Right. Okay. Actually, I'm just going to stop that. Um, just move to there. Okay. So the Evidence Act 1995, Chapter 3, says in 3.1 that it, this chapter is about evidence adduced in proceedings as to whether it is admissible or not. And what I've got on the screen here is exactly what's in the Act. And uh, it then follows on with a very useful diagram, which is the flow chart showing generally what evidence, and I'm talking criminal trial now, but what evidence is admissible, what evidence is not admissible. And even though it provides information about the Commonwealth jurisdiction, that can be a useful checklist when you're considering the state jurisdiction as well. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's in the notes and it is directly taken from the Commonwealth Evidence Act. Any questions about that? I would use work your way through that as you proceed. A couple more things before we wrap up for tonight. I want to talk about the burden of proof. We talked about that last week. We'll just mention it again. So there are two burdens of proof in Queensland and elsewhere. Number one, the evidential burden. Number two, the legal burden. Now, do we remember what they, what's the difference between the two? Does anyone want to have a go at that? What do we mean by the evidential burden? What do we mean by the legal burden? I like asking, it gives me a chance to have a cup of tea. Is the legal burden, do you mean, on the balance of probabilities for civil and, hmm, can't remember yes. the other, beyond reasonable doubt for criminal? Beyond reasonable yeah. doubt, yeah. yes, yes. And then the evidential one has a lower standard, is what I wrote in my note. Yeah, yeah. So it needs yep. to raise reasonable doubt on a proposition. In part, yes. In part evidential, in part. but is the lower standard of proof. Yes. Evidential is lower. And these things move around even within a trial. So let's just work through this a bit. What do we mean by evidential burden? What do we mean by legal burden? Let's look at evidential burden from the perspective of a prosecutor in a criminal trial first up. When um, a charge is brought, an indictable, an indictable charge is brought before a court, even though it may end up in the District Court or the Supreme Court, almost every time it will go through what's called a committal process. The committal process is undertaken in the Magistrate's Court and the Magistrate has a test to apply. Mm -hmm. And the test is this. Is there sufficient evidence to warrant this matter going to a jury? Has the prosecution established to my satisfaction as the Magistrate here in the committal that a reasonable jury, reasonably instructed, could convict the defendant. Is, could they reasonably convict? It's pretty low. It's a pretty low threshold, isn't it? The magistrate's not asking him or herself whether they will definitely convict, whether they'll probably convict. 
um, it's more a case of could they possibly convict? And that's kind of the evidential burden for a prosecutor at the magistrate's committal stage. Consequently, it's pretty hard for defence counsel to ask a court to dismiss the charge at committal because the test for prosecution, the evidential burden at that stage is pretty low. Now, if it goes through committal and it goes to a trial in a criminal jurisdiction, then yes, the legal burden is, which is the persuasive burden for a prosecution is beyond reasonable doubt. That's for a trial in a contested manner. Now, let's look at evidential burden from the perspective of defence. When does that apply? In a criminal trial, you might say, aha, that's a trick question because defence don't have to prove anything. They can remain silent throughout the proceedings and they're entitled to say, prove it. And it's always on the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt in a criminal trial. But sometimes the defence will voluntarily take on the evidential burden. They don't have to, but they might. Now, when might defence take on the evidential burden? Well, probably, because, because it's defence, it's probably so they can raise a defence. And the sort of defences that we might see raise an evidential burden would be things like self-defence or provocation or consent. Okay, so if you've got a fight in a car park, you might see defence raise issues to do with self-defence or provocation. If you've got an allegation of rape, you might have though you might have a defence of consent raised. But you see, it's up to defence to put their foot in the door to say there's enough evidence here, Your Honour, for the burden to now shift back to prosecution to disprove or dispel self-defence or consent or provocation, we have presented enough evidence, we have overcome the evidential burden on this issue to show that now it's a serious matter that must be considered and Crown must now negative that issue that we have raised beyond reasonable doubt. Does that make sense? So from a defence perspective, the evidential burden applies. Once the defence has overcome the evidential burden, the onus then goes back onto the Crown to establish that the defendant is guilty beyond reasonable doubt, and that includes negativing the, um, uh, and doing so beyond reasonable doubt as well, saying there is no provocation, there is no consent, and we're going to prove that beyond reasonable doubt. Does that make sense? So we talk about the evidential burden and the legal burden. And guess where you might find a good statement of the law in relation to both the evidential burden and the legal burden. Go back to the Commonwealth Act. Have a look at section 13 of the Act. And you'll see that it talks about issues to do with the... Um, I'm sorry, the Commonwealth Criminal Code, not the Evidence Act, the Commonwealth Criminal Code, sorry. Um, have a look at section 13 of the Commonwealth Criminal Code, which deals with the issues of the evidential burden and the legal burden. Now, remember, of course, if you're dealing with a state issue, you can't quote the Commonwealth Criminal Code as authority for a proposition about the evidential burden or the legal burden. I'm just mentioning these things because they do directly apply in Commonwealth prosecution matters, but they might give you an idea and some guidance, even though you can't quote it, you can't, you can't quote it as an authority when you're dealing with state issues. Samantha, is that reasonably clear? Yeah. Good. Sorry, okay. it is reasonably clear. I'll, I'm just a, still a little bit confused about the raising of the defence and the evidential burden. Um, so do the roles reverse when the defence does that is, or does it, they raise it and then it's still up to the prosecution to prove it, prove yeah. that it's not the case beyond a reasonable doubt? Yes, you're, you're correct. Okay. But I, I'm just going to mention this because 
I'm probably misleading you in the in a in an expectation of how the trial runs. It's not like a boxing bout or a cricket match. Probably cricket match might be a better analogy. It's not like the court will say, okay, prosecution, it's your you're into bat. Now you've got to see how many runs you can score. Defense. Um, it's your first innings. What do you what do you say? Um, you know, and then they get up and they have their bat and say, "Or oh, we've, ra- we've we've raised enough now to to show that there's self defence." Okay, let's let's go to the second innings for prosecution. Now you have to dispel that beyond reasonable doubt. It's not quite as structured as that. In the course of the trial, defence may, through simple questions of a prosecution witness, uh, obtain enough evidence which through that witness establishes um, a doubt and or a defence to the evidential burden. So it's not as clear cut. It's more subtle on that, Does that, if that makes sense. All right. So thank you. And, and we call these things the tactical burden as well. And so the tactical burden may sh- shift and it will very often shift between prosecution and defence. Um, and it's all aligned with that issue of evidential burden and legal burden. Um, so one really good case to consider when talking about issues to do with the tactical burden is Weissensteiner against the Queen. You'll see this case a lot. It was 1993, 178 CLR. And um, in Weissensteiner, the High Court had to rule on directions of a trial judge when the accused remained silent during a trial. And the court said that in a criminal trial, hypotheses consistent with innocent may sense cease to be rational or reasonable in the absence of evidence uh, when the evidence might have been within the knowledge of the accused. That's not going to make a whole lot of sense just now, but keep that in mind that the tactical burden can shift and there may be arguments as to who bears this burden at various times during the trial. And it's not always clear cut. So Weissensteiner against the Queen is a good case that we'll deal with later that um, you can think about in the context of tactical burden. Now, the, when we're talking about having to prove something, it's not just criminal proceedings. It's in civil proceedings as well. Mm. Now, we do know that the standard of proof in civil proceedings is on the balance of probabilities. So we know that. And we've heard about this thing called the Brigginshaw standard of proof. Mm -hmm. We know that as well. Mm -hmm. Or the Brigginshaw test, as it's sometimes alluded to. Um, I will just say that in terms of Brigginshaw, it doesn't create, look, there is not a third standard of proof. Brigginshaw doesn't create a third standard of proof. It just says that, look, the more important the consequence of a matter the better quality that we want, the better quality evidence we want to see produced. That's really what the Brigginshaw is all about. Mm -hmm. But I just want to raise this with you, that in civil proceedings, it's still the balance of probabilities. Someone, the plaintiff, has to prove that something is more likely than not. And it's not necessarily just a matter of weighing up two alternatives and saying, oh, look, I prefer that one instead of this one. Mm -hmm. Let me explain that distinction that I'm trying to make by reference to a case. Now, the case is Risa Shipping, SA against Edmonds. That's R-H-E-S-A, Shipping against Edmonds. It's an English case. It's 1985, 1 WLR 958. It's really interesting, this case. You may have read about it in your textbook. So what happened is this. A shipping company sued an insurer for insurance payment. The shipping company lost its ship. When I say lost its ship, I mean it went down. It wasn't a Bermuda Triangle thing. Um, But even though it went down, it was not immediately obvious why it went down because the ship sank in the middle of the Mediterranean in calm seas. Not exactly the sort of place, we're not talking about the Cape of Good Hope or or the the Cape Horn or anything. 
It's the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. It's calm seas and the ship has gone down. Now, what happened is that they, they determined that a large hole appears to have been sprung within the ship and that's what caused it to sink. So you'll hear about lawyers developing case theories. So the case theory for the shipping company was that the vessel had struck a submerged submarine. That's why it sank. This large hole just appeared. It wasn't Martians that did it. It struck a submarine, water came in and it went down straight away. Insurance company said, no, our case theory is that the vessel was badly maintained and it was simply, the, the hole was developed as a result of that poor maintenance. Um, the trial said, look, we don't know. It's the balance of probabilities. We have to make a ruling here. So we are going to say that the shipping company's version is correct. It's improbable that it struck a submarine, but that's less improbable than the theory from the insurance company that it was due to poor maintenance. The insurance company appealed to the High Court and the High Court said, we're going to overturn this decision of the trial judge because even though um, the court found that it was more likely to be as a result of the submarine than not, it's still up to the plaintiff to prove something beyond reasonable doubt. It's not a matter of choosing between two improbable theories, which one you prefer. You've still got to prove it beyond reason. Sorry, you've got to prove it beyond on the balance of probabilities. Not just one is more likely than not uh, the case. So the ultimate burden was still on the shipping company and it had to do something more than merely proving a theory that was less improbable than the other theory. It had to produce a theory that could stand up on its own and allow the court to draw a positive inference in, fa inference in favour of it on the balance of probabilities. I hope that makes sense. All right, I know I've run out of time. Thank you for your patience. I do want to leave you with two important things though. The first is, have a look at the Evidence Act. You've got it right this time. The Evidence Act, Commonwealth. You probably think I've got a bias in favour of the Commonwealth Evidence Act. I actually think it's better. Um, am I allowed to say that? But you can't, again, you can't quote it for Queensland authorities, but it provides you with some good guidance and some ideas. Have a look at section 140, which is really a way of talking about the Brigginshaw test. It doesn't say it, but it really is. Okay. So that's a good guide as to what we mean by Brigginshaw. But actually have a look at Brigginshaw um, and try and find a quote. There's a quote from Justice Dixon um, in that case, and it talks about reasonable satisfaction and um, talking about the consequences of the fact to be proved, which is um, useful. The other thing I want to talk to you about briefly, it's the, and I promise it's the last thing, and you've been really patient, and I'll share the screen for this, is the um, bench books. If you haven't found your way to the bench books, please do so because the bench books provide a great resource for you as a student and a practitioner. Hopefully you're now seeing the web page for the Queensland Courts website. Supreme and District Court Criminal Directions Bench Book. There are other bench books, but this is the, uh, the one that I'm showing you now. And it has great information that you can use in evidence law because this is where the courts will look um, in terms of trying to explain something to a jury in a criminal case. So let's look at bench book number 16 and it talks about evidence admitted against one defendant only. See the key word there, evidence. You think, oh, this is evidence law and this is evidence law as explained by a judge to a jury. Now it's not prescribed. Many judges don't follow the, the material in the bench books, but it's there as a guide. And it's a pretty re reliable guide because a judge is going to say it. Another one that I want to bring to your attention specifically is no, uh, number 60, which deals with the issue of reasonable doubt. 
So if you're trying to describe what is meant by reasonable doubt, then you can always consider what a judge says to a jury and quote the bench book. You can quote this, it's publicly available material. So in an examination context, if you quote something from the bench book, you will get kudos from me because it is a very reliable um, source of uh, material and a great place to look. Okay, I promised that would be the end of it. I will leave it at that. Uh, if you're really keen, you can go on and have a look at, say, Section 124 of the Drugs Misuse Act, Queensland. I just snuck that in, didn't I? And it deals with evidential onus and a reversal of the onus. Okay. Any questions? Yes, Samantha? Sorry. Um, it is just in relation to the cases from week one. Um, I've really struggled to get RV Fitzner, um, and I'm not sure if it's just me or... I can get all the other cases, including, including Wilmington, but I can't get... Okay. Would you mind, um, if you, I don't think you've done this already, would you mind asking on you, Crew? Yeah, yeah. It'll give me and others a chance to look for that as well. Yeah, excellent. Thank, Thank you. you, Samantha. Appreciate that. All right. Any other questions, comments? All good? Okay. And um, Vivian, I think you... Um, have seen the second assessment. You've all seen the second assessment. I've changed it so that you've now got a choice of movies. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, I'll end the session now. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Vivian. If you're watching this recorded session, please consider joining us live on a Wednesday evening. Okay. All the yes. best. Bye there. Thanks. Thank you.